Hello and welcome back to another Wi-Fi Sheep Tech video. Now, those of you that follow our channel will know that we're quite a fan of the older BBC Micro, the Acorn 8-bit machine, British build, for, dating from about 1981 onwards. Uh, over here in the UK, the BBC Micro is still quite a common machine. Um, a lot of them show up all the time, so you can get your hands on one quite quickly. Uh, in today's video, I'd like to show you how to go about restoring BBC Micro and getting an 8-bit machine back up and running. Over its 13-year lifespan, a number of versions of the BBC Micro were produced by Acorn, the most common being the Model B, manufactured between 1981 and 1986, and the later Master 128 machine, dating from 1986 to 1994. It's this last generation 8-bit machine we're going to look at today. The BBC Master Series computer comprises of an improved version of the MOS Technologies 6502, known as the 65SC12 single core processor, clocked to 2 MHz. 128K of RAM, which was also shared with the video ULA and 4-channel mono sound chips. Interestingly, this computer looks to have come from a school, still having its PAT electrical safety labels, showing the computer could have been in use around 1999 year 2000. However, the following years have not been kind to this micro. The case has a number of scratches and marks, and is overall filthy. The R key is also missing, being broken off. Oddly, a system machine that came from the same source also had the R key missing. And it's likely that this was done by the school at the time to force the withdrawal of these computers. What can I say? Teachers at the time really wanted to hang on to their micros. So in order to return this BBC Master to its former glory, we first need to take it apart. Luckily, with most Acorn products, this is relatively straightforward. And in this case, it's just a removal of the four screws from the underside of the case. I normally put all the loose screws in a pot or container to keep all the bits together. With all the screws removed, we can now flip the case over and remove the top, allowing us to get a good look inside. We'll start with the 240 volt stepping mains power transformer this will need some caps replacing. The rather leaky and long expired CMOS battery pack, this will also need replacing. And the overall insides will need a good clean. The first step was to remove the battery unit. On a BBC Master, this is very easy, as it's just clipped to the motherboard and not attached to anything else. Next, we'll remove the keyboard. This is attached via three screws and two smaller screws and clips attached to the chassis earth. With these removed, we can now disconnect the keyboard by pulling out the two short ribbon leads that connected to the main motherboard. With everything detached, the keyboard simply lifts out of the case. We'll come back to the keyboard later. Next, we can remove the speaker. This is attached to the plastic surround of the cartridge slots, which is only friction fitted and can simply be lifted off the motherboard with the speaker cable unplugged. We can now look at removing the mains power cables from the motherboard. These are clipped in, but after 30 odd years, it takes a bit of persuasion to come free. It may not be obvious at first, but the screws holding the motherboard in place are in fact the four screws either side of the cartridge sockets and need to be removed. The sockets themselves are soldered in place, so we don't have to worry about them coming loose. With all screws and cables out, we can now remove the main motherboard. Finally, we can turn our attention to the PSU. This is held in via three screws, which once removed, allow the PSU to be freely removed. We now get a better look at the bottom of the case, and like the top, it's full of years worth of dust and dirt. First off, with the help of my partner, we try cleaning the cases in the kitchen sink with hot water and washing off liquid. This did take most of the grime off, but did expose the yellowing to the plastic caused by years of exposure to sunlight. It also failed to remove the most stubborn marks or areas with deep scratches. So I decided to try again, this time outside, 
using domestic cream cleaner and a scouring pad. As you can see, this did remove all the remaining stubborn marks and dirt. I then hosed down the case using a pressure washer, not realising the camera had gotten wet, so it was out of focus. Returning to the outdoor workbench, I treated the plastics with a cream peroxide solution before wrapping them in cling film. For leaving them outside in the sun for most of the day. The process, known as retro brighting, removes the yellowing from most plastics and should return the BBC Master to its original off white cream appearance. After most of the afternoon in the sun, I removed the parts and washed off the remaining peroxide again using the pressure washer. I think you'll agree, they look a lot, lot better. Okay, so now I turned my attention to the keyboard. I first used a damp paper towel to clean up around the keys the best I could, but the keys were so dirty that I resorted to removing them altogether. Before returning to the main board and cleaning around the switches. I also used a small paintbrush to aid with the removal of dust. Back at the kitchen sink, the keys were soaked in a sugar soap solution before being scrubbed and then laid out to dry on the dishcloth. Turning my attention back to the keyboard, the switch for the missing R key had been snapped off at the top, so needed replacing. Luckily, the same key switches were used in the Acorn Electron series of computer, so I was able to lift the switch from a non-working Spurs machine I had lying around. To do the repair, I first needed to locate the points on the rear keyboard PCB where the affected switch is soldered in. I used the marker pen to highlight the points that needed to be desoldered. And using my soldering iron and hand pump, I heated up the solder points and removed the solder to release the switch. After turning the keyboard back over, I was able to pull out the broken switch and replace it with the new one recovered from the broken Acorn Electron. However, in the process of doing this, one of the solder pads had come away from the keyboard PCB so I had to use a section of wire to replace the broken track area and make the through connection. As a precaution, I did test through conductivity with my multimeter. And as you can see, all is working fine. Okay, so with that done, it was time to put the keys back on. It's always a good idea to take a photo or in my case, have another master keyboard handy to check where the keys should go. So I'm just adding the last few. However, we're still missing an R key top. The solution to this came from another scrap machine, in this case an earlier BBC Micro Model B, and although the key switches are not compatible, the key tops are. So it's simply the case of removing the R key, giving it a quick clean before placing it onto the master's keyboard. The BBC Micro's power unit, or PSU, is notorious in its old age for blowing up. This is due to a few capacitors in the PSU that have dried out over time and so need replacing. Unlike the Model B, the BBC Master's PSU is a real pain to get into, first needing four screws removing from the base of the unit. Next this rubber cable clip needs to be pulled loose using a pair of pliers, being careful not to damage any of the power cables. The outer metal case can then be pulled off the circuit board. To completely detach the two parts, the two plugs connecting the power transformer to the power on off switch need to be unclipped. Again, I used a pair of pliers to do this. On the main PSU board, the three capacitors that cause these issues are the two smoothing caps here and here, and a more traditional cylinder cap here. Luckily, a number of kits can be bought off the internet containing replacement parts. As with the keyboard switch, I marked the areas needing desoldering, again heating these up and using my solder pump to release the affected components. After fitting the new replacements, it was simply a job of resoldering the joints back together. After only a few minutes, I had a refurbished PSU ready to be reunited with its outer case. The PSU case, however, did require some cleaning. As with the main case, I used cream cleaner and a soft dishcloth for this. 
As the power cord is attached to the PSU case, I also took the opportunity to give it a good clean and remove any stubborn marks. As you can see, it began to clean up really nicely. After reassembling the PSU, I was able to fit it back into its lower case. I did however add a label to the PSU to remind anyone in the future that the PSU had been serviced and the dateness was done. Turning our attention to the main PCB, I used a small battery powered vacuum cleaner to remove the dust build up. It is important to do this around the processor and ULA as these chips get very hot and need as much ventilation as possible. Also, don't forget to do the backs of the sockets and ports. For the rear panel, I use spray-on window cleaner and a cloth to bring up the plastic bevel. Some sockets, such as the BNC composite video, are extruded out from the case and can get very dull and mucky over time. I use the glass fibre brush to clean sockets like this. Not only does it remove the dirt, but it also brings up the shine of the metal. With that done, the clean motherboard can be reunited with the case. And the PSU cables plugged back in, making sure to get the polarities the correct way around. I also took the opportunity to reattach the cartridge slot cowling and speaker unit. Unlike earlier models of the BBC Micro, the BBC Master contains a CMOS backup battery to allow the computer to retain user settings. The battery unit is made up of three domestic AA cells soldered to a one-way diode and shrink-wrapped. In order to replace this, we need to extract the diode and cabling from the unit. I did this by cutting open the wrapping and cutting off the cables of the battery terminals. I bought a brand new battery holder and soldered the recovered cabling to its terminals. The diode is needed to stop the computer trying to recharge the cells, as the circuit was originally designed for a rechargeable lithium power cell, but was recalled by Acorn due to fires from overcharging. Next, I attached some sticky pads to the base of the battery holder before, with fresh double A's installed, reconnecting the CMOS unit to the micro. I also took the opportunity to reconnect the newly repaired keyboard. So finally we come to setup and testing. With the BBC Master back together, I'll connect it to a modernish LCD flat screen TV. Off the internet, you can buy compatible 6 pin DIN to RGB SCART cables, allowing for a veteran 8 bit machine to use modern displays. So here we go, first power up in over 16 years. And we're greeted with success, of sorts. The no language message is normal for a BBC Master that's had a dead CMOS battery for many years. All the machine requires is some setup. With its new battery unit, it should save and retain the settings from now on. First off, using the start ROMs command, I checked all the onboard software and drivers were present. All were labelled as unplugged, and so required a start insert command to bring them all online. After that, I started inputting the required star co dot commands. These are a list of configuration settings that set up everything from boot screen mode to if to load basic or not. After typing my list in and hitting control break on the keyboard to do a hard reset, you can see I hadn't quite got everything right. However, after five minutes or so, I managed to coax the machine back into life. And as you can see here, even got the 1770 floppy controller to load in. One final test was to use a new build cartridge board. This will not only test the cartridge slots, but the game loaded onto the ROM of the cart a clone of Pac-Man called Snapper, is very good for testing for any internal faults or issues with the computer's RAM or video ULA chip. The game loaded up and played perfectly. So we can assume this BBC Master is working correctly. Oh, there was just one more thing I forgot to do. Just needed to reattach the acrylic key strip panel to the front of the case. So there we have it, 
from borderline derelict ex-school classroom computer that had not seen any use in over 16 years to a fully restored retro 8-bit gaming or programming collector's piece, hopefully good for many more years to come. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and we'll see you real soon right here on the Wi-Fi Sheep channel. Thanks for watching and bye for now.